Luca, how are you? Good morning, how are you? Nice to be here. Likewise, pleasure to meet you. And I guess um, at the moment, this, uh, this connects people across the world in, in, more, in better ways than ever right now. <laughs> it's, the, it's, uh, it's the new way we're, uh, we're getting together in person, quote unquote, I guess you could say. Indeed, it's an honor to meet you. And I, I, I actually think, again, in, in times of uh, distress like this, there, there are positives. And as I say, I, I would never have got to meet you face to face. So really, really, well, truly. Thanks appreciate very much. Great to um, be here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I just want to welcome everyone uh, to episode two in our Commerce Reimagined series. What we're doing is highlighting change makers, visionaries, and the people who are really defining the way in, of commerce in this complex world. So again, Jay Walker, pleasure to have you. Thank you for giving us your time today to meet with us. Great, glad to be here. Thanks. Um, so I'm Nick Walsh, I'm the uh, CEO of, um, of Geometry in Middle East and North Africa. Um, I'm here today with uh, Jay Walker. Uh, he's the Chief Knowledge uh, and Brand Marketing Officer for Kantar Worldwide. Correct, correct Jay Walker? That, yep, that's it, thank you. Great. Um, he's a prolific speaker. He's an author of four books, blogger, tweeter, radio commentator. There isn't much this man hasn't done, and I'm very honored to be in his presence here today. <laughs> well, thank you. This, is, uh, this all gives me a chance to add a video uh, interviewee and presenter to my, uh, to my list of things, too. <laughs> and, a, and a wonderful background you have there as well. I'm intrigued by the uh, beautiful books or records you have in the background. Well, uh, those albums there uh, over my shoulder just prove that I never throw anything away, so. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so today we're going to be covering off uh, a very, very topical uh, uh, point at the moment, which is about hygiene, um, very high on everyone's agenda. It's a surreal time for everyone at the moment, globally, living in this pandemic. And I think probably one of the only occasions where there are global trends, truly global trends that are affecting every single market and every single corner of the world. What we're seeing with hygiene at the moment is it, it, there, are, there are very few places the general public can actually go out and, and, and visit. Yeah? The, one of the only places actually are the, are the pharmacies and the uh, modern trade supermarkets. So it's, uh, it's incredibly important that we're seeing retailers innovate and change in this space. They have to look after their shoppers. Brands have to take more responsibility in this space as well. So um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, first of all, what you're seeing around the world. How do you think retailers are reacting to this pandemic? Well, I think retailers have been measuring up to the challenge. I think one of the interesting things that we have seen at work here is something that we have talked about during past disruptions, and it's true again. And that is disruptions tend to clear the way for things that were emerging anyway to finally achieve some uh, opportunity to become mainstream and to dominate the marketplace. And so what we've seen for retailers and for marketers of all sorts more broadly is this push into real-time response. So we've been talking about real-time marketing for a very long time. We've been talking about this move towards using data to do uh, things, for example, with digital that enable us to react to consumers in real time. We really had no idea what real time meant until we're suddenly in a marketplace where things are changing day to day. But behind all of this is the necessity that brands have, retailers in particular, to make consumers confident that they can go into the marketplace and react in real time in a safe and secure way. And so that's where this hygiene factor comes into play. I have likened it to what we did immediately after uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and then the sort of decade of terrorism that ensued after that. We locked down on airport security. And we locked down on security in all kinds of public places, public buildings, transit stations of all sorts, but especially airports. And that's kind of iconic, the airport security perimeter. Once you get past that perimeter, then you're in a safe place where things can operate as normal. But it's the perimeter that gives you the ability to have that safe place to do business as usual. And now we're going to have to have a hygiene perimeter. Consumers are going to have to feel like when they go into a store, when they go into a restaurant, when they go to a public event, that there is uh, a hygiene assurance 
that will enable them to feel safe and secure in that space. And so that, I don't think of that so much as a new normal as I do uh, a perimeter or a security a border, if you will, that then enables people to get past it and to get back to uh, the things that they want to do. But marketers are having to respond to this in real time. It's, it's not like we can take a couple of years and study this and figure it out. We've got to do this right now. And that's, that's the challenge at the moment. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think we talk about real time. There's the, there's the real time reactionary, I think, which we've seen the stages and the, and the, and, 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 and the support that both brands and retailers and, and consumers or shoppers are making actually reactionary and real time changes. You're also seeing things like uh, uh, temperatures being taken in, in general public, a lot of sanitization out there at the moment, right. screens in front of retailers, because in many ways, a lot of the time now, the, the, the grocery uh, or retail workers are becoming almost frontliners, right? They're, they're the people who are still continuing to keep, to keep know, business going, and, keep, and, and obviously gloves handed out, masks and such. I mean, certainly here in the Middle East, we're on complete lockdown. Uh, you, you, the only you have to have a permit to leave the, your apart, your house or apartment, and the only place you can go is the retailer. So you have to be very considerate over uh, over the precautions you take when you leave the home. And now a lot of this, and we've seen so many immediate reports about the about the pandemic, and I think everyone's really looking at the future and sustainability. So. I think a lot of these precautions are going to be pretty temporary. And, and as you say, there's a lot, a lot of real time stuff happening. But how do you see the future? So there's been a lot of discussion about the quote unquote new normal. And this is a phrase that always gets used during disruptions like this. Uh, I think we have to remind ourselves that a lot of what we're seeing in the marketplace right now is reactive to the moment. So some of it will persist to some degree, but what consumers are really looking for is not to leap off the edge of the unknown when this is all over. Actually, consumers will just tell you that they want to get back to what they were doing before. And of course, that was filled with lots of change and lots of dynamism. So it's not like people are fleeing change, but people are just saying they want to get back to the way things were before. So I, I think the consumer push is to get back to as much of the old normal as possible. But in order to do that, there are gonna to have to be some new things in place. So until we have a vaccine or some kind of very good therapeutic treatment, this uh, assurance of uh, sanitization, this assurance of hygiene is gonna essentially be the airport security of where we're headed uh, after the pandemic. And that will enable then business to reopen. There's a lot of pressure to reopen economies. As I remind people, we can reopen stores and restaurants and events as much as we want to, but if consumers don't feel safe going there, you're still not gonna be able to uh, re-energize uh, the marketplace. So this is kind of a, a fundamental requirement. And one thing that a lot of retailers have been doing, which I think is quite interesting, is, is moving in the direction of no contact consumer engagement. So it is this promise that nobody has touched your stuff. I, I sometimes refer to this as the don't touch me uh, reality uh, of yeah. the future. You know, it's okay. I'm not yeah. shaking your hand. I don't want you touching my groceries, but I'm happy to come out and, and do business with you. And, and we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, all kinds of businesses are making this promise of no human contact. And, and that's gonna require some shuffling of operating procedures. It's not so much a new business model, but it is certainly a new operating model in order for companies to go back to uh, business as usual. And it is this, this kind of perimeter. And it creates new opportunities in the marketplace as well. Uh, things that we can do, you know, for example, a company might come out and say, uh, we have gone in and cleaned this space and we've given it our certification of hygienic safety and they can put that little emblem on the door uh, and they can go back and renew it every week or whatever frequency is required, but there's going to have to be a business that does that. And, and I think we'll see lots of brands who are in the business of cleaning products right now 
uh, move rapidly into a services space where they can offer uh, this kind of guarantee. So, so there will be new opportunities, but again, I think it is dealing with uh, the issue at hand so that uh, companies and consumers can go back to the kind of things that they're accustomed to. Yeah, absolutely, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, it's fascinating. I think you talked about the no touch or the contactless phenomenon, and it really is something we're seeing. I mean, if you look even at contactless payments, you know, you, this, right. this, could, this could even you know, threaten cash in certain areas. You know, <laughs> people, are, you know, people are really demanding that, that now, yeah, to, to, to not touch. Um, and, it, and with that, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but we, we developed with the WPP team, is that back in 2015, and it's, it's fascinating, a few ideas and innovations, which um, I've seen others in the, in the kind of live virtual experience spaces and the, where you can't have crowds and events, but there's certain ideas that are coming back to relevancy more than ever. Um, and we developed a piece of work in 2015 for Unilever, uh, for uh, one of their sanitization brands. Um, and we implemented all the way across Asia Pacific and parts in the Middle East. And it was an innovation that, um, called hand on hygiene. It sat on trolley handles. Um, and, and effectively what it did, we, we saw a lot of data that huge amount of germs and uh, nasties and bacteria sat on trolley handles. It was one of the uh, yeah. places you couldn't avoid the no touch phenomenon, phenomenon actually. Right. And you still can't. And yeah. Until we have electric uh, trolley cars, it's something <laughs> you have to deal with. Um, but, you know, people were then touching their food and their, their, their fruits and vegetables. So we saw this as a really innovative touch point to um, one that hadn't been used in the shopping journey before. And at the time, it was built very much as a sales driver, sales generator. Uh, but what we're finding now is there's a huge demand actually for it. So we're getting inundated with retailers and brands that are really keen to bring this to market. Uh, we put a lot of work into the R&D around, as you would around any product. But it's really fascinating because it kind of ticks the, the golden triangle, really, of shopper suit. So there's a clear benefit for the brand. There's a clear benefit for the retailer. And there's a clear benefit for the shopper, which is, which is pretty difficult to get. But we're, it, the demand is incredible. We're already looking at bringing it right the way back through globally. And I think, as, to your point, it's an important time for businesses to innovate and maybe to, to extend. And, and this is no longer necessarily about driving sales. That's not what brands are looking for. But this is about much more purposeful uh, work and being able to, 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 to look after retailers. And it's our duty as, as WPP and geometry in, in, in the commerce space to give back. So we're really trying to push this out at the moment. And as I say, look after the retail industry and protect shoppers. Um, just wondering if you've seen that and, and also any other innovations that you've seen. I think it's, it is now the time to innovate. I couldn't agree more. I do think there are lots of innovation opportunities. And of course, again, the history of disruptions and, and frankly, the history of normal kinds of economic downturns shows that uh, unless leading name brand products are doing innovation during these downturns, they tend to lose connection with consumers. Consumers, you know, tend to be focused, they tend to be reactive and they're looking for ways to save money. And unless you can remind them of the other side of that value equation that a name brand product offers, then they're gonna move to other options during this time of financial pressure. So it's important for name brand businesses to innovate during this period of time, to uh, offer more value for what they're doing in the marketplace already. And I'll tell you one big area I think we're gonna see a lot of innovation, and that is around the area of packaging. So, you know, there's been a lot of concern during the pandemic just because people don't know about whether I should touch the mail or whether I can touch the overnight delivery package or whether I can touch the bag at the, at the grocery store. Uh, so packaging has become a source of concern for people. And, by and large, packaging is just kind of one of those things you take for granted. Now, I, I don't mean to diminish it because there are a lot of interesting packaging innovations and a lot of packages are very iconic for certain uh, brands. But nevertheless, it's not one of those things that it's top of mind for consumers. Now, all of a sudden, in a very negative context, people are thinking about packaging. So this is the time to innovate around packaging. This is like attention to packaging you will never get again. <laughs> and it might be negative, but, but people are going to pay attention to your innovation now like no other time. And they're going to pay attention to it because it's, a, it's an innovation that has some real relevance to what they're thinking about, particularly if it's hygienic. So, you know, I do science fiction like speculation. You know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, is, there, is there a packaging that will turn a bright red color every time a coronavirus uh, 
uh, lands on top of it? Or um, can you can you go into a store with your special goggles and and look around at packages and see which packages have been touched by people and have telltale fingerprints? or which packages, you know, have the mark of a robot that has uh, put them <laughs> on the shelf, you know. Yeah, but yeah. but I, I think this is an opportunity for brands to say, packaging is pretty important to our brand right now, like yeah. never before. And it doesn't matter how good the product is inside that package. If, if people are afraid to touch the package, they're not going to get in there. So there's an innovation opportunity here. I, I, I fully agree. And an exciting one at that. If you look at especially fresh produce if you look at if you look at uh, industries like dairy right. where they're really trying to promise the kind of farm to shelf the freshness message it's a much bigger message now than just freshness isn't it that hygiene message that comes across is incredibly important yeah it, it really really is and and i think fresh produce is is actually one of those things that's going to have to rethink a little bit how they engage with consumers and they might not have to reinvent everything they just got to have some kind of recognizable, credible, hygienic perimeter that people feel gives them the guarantee that they're looking for in the marketplace. And that's the innovation platform. That's where you need to brainstorm. I fully, fully agree. And I was going to talk to you a little bit more about, about FMCGs, you know, some of the biggest, most powerful players out there in the FMCG uh, world. Uh, you know, in, in, in probably one of their issues at the moment is more around distribution than it is about than it is around sales, which is this kind of strange right. phenomenon this pandemic brings. Right. But again, uh, if you look at other ways they have to innovate across that supply chain, you know, they've got to bring back the confidence. So you've got you kind of already touched on it, but and packaging is, I, I agree, the, such a critical touch point. But any other ways across from 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 effectively from factory to shelf? Any other ways you think that uh, they'll win back consumer confidence in this space? Well, I think the other thing that brands are dealing with now, which is very much related to distribution and logistics and supply chains, is this issue of self-sufficiency. Um, we, we, it's been talked a lot about as local, but you know, moving away from global supply chains to more local uh, sources of supply is just about being more self-sufficient. It's about having a little capacity built into what is essentially, for many categories right now, a peak load problem. So people wonder about toilet paper. You know, consumers go, why don't you just make more toilet paper? Well, you know, the problem is toilet paper is a commodity product. It, it has low margins. The way you make money on toilet paper is you run your production lines 24-7 and you distribute it through a just-in-time uh, logistics network. So there was no capacity in toilet paper lines to make more toilet paper. You, you know, when you have a little bit of stockpiling that puts a run on the shelf, you, you're already running production lines 24-7. You can't produce anymore. So the, it's this peak load problem that that a lot of brands are facing right now. And, and as, they, as they reinvent supply chains for a little more resiliency to I think what we're now beginning to realize is a future that's gonna be filled with more and more of these kinds of periodic disruptions, not necessarily more pandemics, but you know, since the beginning of the 21st century, we've had a terrorism disruption. We've had an economic disruption. We've now had a pandemic disruption. Disruptions are sort of back on the table as, as the normal way of life, which historically they are. And so we're going to have to rethink some of these um, assumptions that we've had about supply chains to have more of this uh, kind of resiliency built into them. That's, that's not a, a, a marketing issue per se, but it is part of the marketing promise and so behind the scenes, you've got to make sure that you can fulfill consumers' needs in times of high demand or in times of uh, crisis. And that's, that's been a little bit of an issue in certain categories. I fully, I fully agree. And I think if I'm going, I, I'm going a little bit off, off questions here, but I'm really intrigued to know when we're talking so much about these things at the moment with clients, and, and, and I'm, it, it's fascinating actually what's happening now. But you know, on, on one hand, we have e-commerce, we have direct to consumer coming in fast, we have traditional bricks and mortar, and it was and it's getting to the point where you know e-commerce is going to take over. But actually, bricks and mortar have shown they've it's still got a it's still got a place, but right? it's still got a, a strong yeah. position. Yeah? And I think I'd love to hear a bit more about that. I know it's off right. the hygiene topic a little bit. 
Sure. But, yeah, to hear your point of view. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about how online and delivery is now going to take over the world. And, and I, again, I, I'm just a little cautious about that. Um, you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier this kind of private label phenomenon. What happens during downturns are asymmetric share gains. So uh, private label brands, historically, when you look back 30 years and you track private label brands uh, around the globe, during downturn after downturn, what you find is that private label brands become more popular during downturns, no surprise. And then you get a recovery and private label brands give back their share, but they don't give it all back. They keep a little bit. So it's called an asymmetric share gain. That's kind of the marketing academic term for it. So there is a change after the downturns. Private label brands are a little bit more uh, a part of the marketplace than they were before the downturn. But their share after the downturn is not the same as it was during the downturn. They give a lot of it back. There is a change, but it's not a change that mirrors what you were seeing during the downturn. So when I think about online and delivery, I'm just thinking they've achieved a huge share right now because of necessity. When we come out of this, are they going to keep all of these share gains? I don't think so. I think they're going to keep a lot of them, but I don't think they're going to keep all of them. So it's going to be an asymmetric phenomenon for online and delivery as well. And so the question is, how do we forecast that? Because if you just look at the survey data being collected in the moment, you're going to overinterpret the data. You're going to make some wild prediction based on the data. And the problem with the data, the problem with asking consumers what they're doing right now and maybe how they're going to live after the pandemic is that these opinions are reactive. You know, they're not, they're unusual opinions. They're opinions that are, are not typical of normal times. So we have to, we have to be a little cautious in how we handle these kinds of data. I do think we're going to see some changes, but I think it's going to be asymmetric. Uh, and I think we uh, we need to do a little bit better job of, of trying to figure out how to forecast that. Fantastic. I'm pleased I asked you that that question. I think <laughs> it's probably just as a link and, and, and to wrap up, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, hygiene in physical retail, and that's been kind of the primary subject. But I think this is a nice link back to uh, to e-commerce and to, to direct to consumer modeling as well, because and you and you've touched on it with packaging, but hygiene is a massive factor there as well, right? It's, it's still yes. it's still impacting there just as much. Yes, so hygiene is a big deal. So we came out of the financial crisis, and discounters uh, just boomed uh, in the decade or so after that because finance was at the top of the list. Now we're coming out of a disruption where hygiene is more at the top of the list, and and now you look at certain kinds of retail chains and a consumer walking up and down the shelves goes, hmm, I don't really know where this product came from. And this is kind of a dirty store. I'm not really comfortable in here. Doesn't feel hygienic. So now hygiene for many consumers is going to trump price. I might be yeah. willing to pay a little bit more to get that guarantee of hygiene. And so that's going to affect uh, online retailers in particular. You know, you're just going to go third party seller who is that? Who's touching my stuff before yeah. it comes to me? Or, or who are all these people who've touched it in the warehouse, touched it in uh, the delivery truck? Uh, you know, I need some kind of guarantee. And maybe that's where packaging comes into play. Yeah. If your package gets to your doorstep and, it's, and, and the little strip on it is blue, then it's safe. If the little strip on it is red, you get a free return. Yeah, really interesting thinking and actually could have a huge impact on gray, mar gray market products and counterfeit products, actually. It could, have, it could, have, it could be a very, very big benefit. To <laughs> actually, I hadn't thought about that. That's a very good uh, point. <laughs> but, it, but it's a really good thing. Yeah, source of manufacturing will become even more important and, and, uh, and people, will pay a, people will pay a premium to know where the origination and where destination is. So, yeah, incredible piece of thinking, actually. Again, you don't know where something's been when it arrives at your door, do you? At you know, least that's you right. That yeah. Tool, you have some sort of one more reference. You know, already you're seeing uh, all over social media people decomposing bar uh, uh, codes that are on packages to say yeah. if it's got these three letters, it comes from one country. If it's got yeah. these three letters, it comes from another country. 
And, I, you know, I don't know how long that will last, but it's certainly going to last during a period of time until we get something like a vaccine or better therapeutics. People are going to be more conscious of this. Joe Walker, thank you so much for, uh, for the conversations. I've really enjoyed it. We could talk um, for, for many hours on this subject. So thank you very much for your insights. It's been, sure. been brilliant. Thank you very much. No problem. And for anyone who wants to hear more about this subject, it's a very topical one at the moment, hygiene, but it's also going to be one which is very much uh, future, about the future, which you've heard about today. Uh, you can follow Jay Walker Smith on LinkedIn. Uh, that's on Jay Walker Smith, or you can find myself, Nick Walsh, on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.